Greetings and welcome to the ROI Clear podcast. My name is Ray Hightower, and today we are fortunate to have as our guest Mr. Powell Chi. Powell Chi is managing partner of Radiant World Enterprise with investments all over the U.S. He's a commercial real estate investor specializing in self storage. He has invested in multifamily. We are honored to have him here today. Welcome, Powell Chi. Hey, I appreciate it, Ray. Great to see you, buddy. Uh, and thank you so much for having me on. Thank you so much. Glad to have you here. Uh, to kick us off, uh, why don't we start with uh, our, our elevator pitch? It's something we do uh, all the time here at ROI Clear. And for those who are new to ROI Clear, Powell is on an elevator with someone he wants to influence. And Powell, what would you say to that person in the course of an elevator ride? Sure. Uh, mine's pretty simple. I usually just say, hi, hello. Um, you know, what I do is I help uh, I help people achieve their financial goals uh, through investing in real estate or businesses. Excellent. All right. And very, very. Uh, I, I, could I just add to there just really quickly? Yes, go ahead. I never I never just end it with that. OK, oh. I will always end it with a question of like, um, do you are you or I usually ask something like, do you uh, do you know of anybody that has um, it, have ever invested in real estate? And something to follow mm. up with a question, with a question to them to like keep the conversation going. Because if I just end it like that, it's just like, oh, okay, well, it's done. I, the conversation's done. But if I ask a question about, have you ever invested in real estate, or do you know anybody that's invested in real estate, or you know, what do you think about the real estate market, or you know, just kind of, just in general, just kind of easy, kind of probing questions. Then if the conversation flows, it's a lot. It, it's it's just much better from there, right? Then you can then you can continue the conversation and and. Yeah, I would say that's the way I usually do it. That is brilliant. You're the first person I've asked about an elevator pitch who says that you end it with a question mm -hmm. and yeah. you continue the conversation that way. Yeah, because, that, you know, then you, you know, the, you, when you talk to people about, especially in sales, it's right, is the per person's asking questions is the one that's really controlling the conversation, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you are able to direct the conversation in a way that you want to, right? And and if they decide not to answer it in a way or in a way that says they're not interested in real estate, they don't know any idea, they don't really care about that stuff, it's all right. Then you just, you know, just let it go. But if if they are interested, you'll know pretty quickly because you've asked a question to them and they want to they want to give them or you want to give them a chance to talk. You don't want to just blurt out a bunch of words and then they're like, oh, hold, hold, hold on. I didn't ask for all that. Right. So I make it very simple, very quick. And then ask them about you know uh, about their experience because they want to talk. Everybody wants to talk about my own experience and my what do I do? What do I do? Right. So that's yes. uh, that's why I do approach it that way. I'm going to totally steal that idea, pal. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah, I have I to ask it. you what what would you say is the most interesting response you've received to that question? If you ask them, hey, uh, do you know anyone who is invested in real estate, or or uh, do you have any? Or I don't know that you would say, do you have any interest in real estate? Because that could sound like you're selling. But do you know mm -hmm. anyone who's in, invested in real estate? What kind of responses do you get? Exactly. So I I get the responses from from oh yeah my. My brother did it or yeah my 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 sister-in-law does it or i have a friend who's bought a house yeah in in you know they bought it in atlanta or something you know i have all those kind of conversations and then that just opens the door so i know they're interested i know that they somewhat know what they're talking about right um all the way to people like they don't care right and so you yeah. get this as well they're just like no but uh you know um wasn't it great that the Rams won last night? You know, something like that. You know, it's, then you're just like, okay, they, they, they don't care. Yeah, they're, 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 yeah, they're yeah. not interested at all. And, and I don't push it. You know, that's just me. I don't push it on them. I just ask them the conversation. Then they're not very interested. That's okay. You know, right. No and clearly, you're very successful selling it. One thing that's remarkable about the the field that we're in, when we're raising money, when we're talking to investors, what we do very much sells itself. You mm -hmm. know, the the key thing we have to do is identify the people who have a propensity who have an inclination to go the route and we're, we're we're essentially sifting and having conversations and we're making sure we deliver on our promises i think mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely it's not really a selling thing right so it's not really something that i'm out here to, to sell you an idea to come invest with me right it's like i present it it's an opportunity if people like it and they want to or they want to learn more um great i'm happy to i'm happy to talk to them but if they're not interested and it's just not something that they're into i'm not trying to 
hey, it's, you got to get into it. It's right now. If you don't get into it, it's going to be, you know, you're, you're, you know, I don't put on that, that pressure or anything like that. It's, it's yeah, yeah. You know. We never have to do that. How did you get started in doing syndications? And for those who, who uh, don't know, uh, Powell focuses on, on uh, self-storage, syndications for self-storage facilities. And right now you're in five states and you're expanding. How did you begin focusing on self-storage? You were in multifamily at first, but how did you end up in self-storage? Yeah, just to rewind a little bit, um, you know, I started in multifamily. So I, I kind of said I grew up in multifamily and in, in that world of multifamily uh, doing syndications there. I was a general partner on five different syndications um, in multifamily. And then really that brought me to about 2020. 2020, the thing what happened to me, which was what happened to everybody was COVID. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I said, hey, I, I'm, I know I'm not going to buy any multifamily for at least six months. Just me personally, I just didn't want to bring my investors into um, a lot of unknowns and just a mm -hmm. lot of things going on with lending and all kinds of, you know, question marks. So I thought, well, at this time, let me just let me add another asset class to my mix and find out if this is something that I'm interested in. Um, cause I've heard of, you know, everybody hears about other asset classes, but you don't really know about them. You don't really know how to understand them, um, how to underwrite them, how to run them, how to, how to evaluate them, how to source them. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I just took the time. I said, I'll, I'll just take this time to go ahead and learn this. And if it's something that I really like, then maybe I'll jump in. If it's something that I just don't like, then, then I can at least cross it off my list of these, uh, shiny objects. Right. And just say, you know, I, I don't want to do that one. Um, so that's what I did in 2020. I uh, was able to purchase my first one in 2021, the very beginning of 2021, small one, uh, just mm -hmm. with a small group of friends and family. I didn't really want to tell all of my network that I was all of a sudden adding another asset class because that was like, whoa, 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 you know, like you've been such a multifamily guy this whole time talking about multifamily and now you're doing a, a different asset class. So I didn't want to really tell anybody until I actually did it. Um, mm -hmm. So then I did it with a, uh, just a couple of friends and family. Like I said, just the elevator pitch was really, really simple to them. It was I, I think I pitched seven people and six of them said yes. And and so we all just, we, we purchased this property, I mm -hmm. uh, got it done. And then um, and then I was able to tell the rest of my network after that. And sure. and and since then, we, you know, like you said, we operate in now five states, uh, 16 different locations that we, that we have since then. So. Did you have some of your investors who said, pal, why didn't you tell me about that first deal? Um, yes, I've had people that have asked me like, Hey, like when, when did you do this? I didn't, I didn't even know that you were doing this. And, and now all of a sudden you have two, three deals, four deals under your belt and you didn't even tell me about them. Like, I was like, yeah, I, I mean, I try to tell you, you know, I try to tell you maybe on number two, three or four, but, uh, not really on number one. Number one was just yeah. kind of like friends and family people that knew me, people that trusted me, have invested with me, uh, for years. And I just reached out to them first. Got it. So mm -hmm. what do the numbers look like on self-storage versus multifamily? Like what kind of IRR, what kind of cash on cash, uh, equity multiple, what are you getting on those? Mm -hmm. I, I will tell you this, uh, and and this is sort of to be a, a little bit honest about how how we approach everything and, and we mm -hmm. do our underwriting and and what we show in terms of numbers is that we tried, we get deals that we think are home run deals. We're looking for home run type of deals, okay? Mm. And and what I, what I mean that for a home run is that we can within that maybe three to four year period that we are comfortably able to project that we can take our deal and refinance it and refinance a hundred percent of our investors capital. Okay. So not every deal is able to do that. You have to have a lot of uh, meat on the bone in order to mm -hmm. achieve that. Right. So yes. that's what I consider a home run deal. And we are looking mm -hmm. for home run deals. Now that in that case, if it is a home run and we're able to do that, and refinance that property in say three to four years, return 100% of our investors' capital. They still stay in the deal. And mm -hmm. now we have no, no capital at risk in the deal. We operate it for a longer term. We maybe refinance every five years. We, we uphold it for a longer period than just, than just the, the normal five years. Um, that is what we're looking for. But if that, say we're not able to achieve it, well, we're, all, we're not able to achieve 100% return of capital. Well, then we'll probably just sell the property in five years. Okay. Mm. And so that, and that's what we see is like, Hey, this, it wasn't a home run. It ended up being a double or triple, or maybe even a single, but it right. was, we're not aiming for singles. We're not aiming to, you know, we're, we're taking the big swings at the home runs so that if we're able to achieve it, Hey, fantastic. You know, you just, you hit it out of the park, but if you're not, yeah. if we're not able to achieve it, 
we're, we're still able to, you know, uh, get a, a really good return to our investors over that five-year period. And I will tell you in our pro forma, just so, um, you know, we talk a little bit more about the numbers. We in general are, uh, I would say very competitive to slightly, maybe a little bit above. I don't know, maybe depends on what pro formas you're, you're looking at, but the way our pro formas, um, are the way that we've had have written them uh, and 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 kind of projected everything is that they will project to be about I don't know say a, a two times equity multiple in in about five mm-hmm. years okay and that's what mm-hmm. we project on our pro formas right. but that is Plan B that is a sale in five years okay Plan A is something we don't project on our pro formas which like I said is a maybe a, a refinance at that year three or four because mm-hmm. and a hundred percent return of capital, because that's not a, it's not a IRR type of calculation. So it's kind of weird to do that and, and really show it would, it would be like comparing apples to oranges. If you compare that to other people's um, other people's deals or, or right. family deals. So in this way, we just show, Hey, in order to compare apples to apples, we're going to show a five-year sale where it's generally about a two times equity multiple. And that mm-hmm. way people can say, okay, well, is this, does this look, um, they can compare it and, and understand it and compare it to another multifamily deal. So in essence, our deals are very competitive to, uh, you know, returns wise are going to be competitive of what you're seeing, but that is basically plan B. It's actually plan C, just so you know, it's actually plan C for us, but we have two other exit strategies ahead of that, which we don't show in our pro forma. We just say, Hey, we're going to aim for these, but you know, we may not hit them. So you need to be comfortable with if we don't hit them and we hit plan C, this is where we land a two times equity multiple in five years. Are you comfortable with that? Okay. Then we're going to try to do better. And we think we can do better. So in your pro forma, in the investor deck that you distribute to your LP investors, your limited partner investors, you have what you consider to be plan C, what you consider to be your worst case scenario. I, I'll call it that because it's plan C, but worst case scenario. And that is competitive with what other syndicators are putting out as their blue sky, everything is rosy, everything smells like potpourri scenario. And mm-hmm. so then you do that. And, and don't let me put words in your mouth, but this is what I'm hearing based on what you said. And so I'm saying it back to you to make sure I'm understanding you. So your plan C is what you put in your investor packet. And then during your webinar or in one-on-one conversations, you'll say, hey, our plan C is to sell the property, give you a 2X equity multiple. However, we have a track record of doing a cash out refi, giving you 100% return of capital. And as those of us in the business know, and all LPs know who are in this business, then they're in a position where they're getting an infinite return on investment and you just don't want to put an infinity symbol next to the letters IRR because people will think yeah. you're ridiculous. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that, that would be just, you know, and then you're, then you're sort of that uh, over promising, right? I'm going to put yeah. infinity returns, you know, that it's like, Hey, well, we're trying to get there. Um, we also have another extra strategy in place too, but we don't, um, we don't want to put those on paper. We can talk to people about them and, and what that would mean. But in terms of on paper, where people are going to look at our projections and, and figure out, okay, based off of uh, you know your income and expenses, your 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 pro forma, will you be able to achieve this two x equity multiple in five years? And we're, and, I yeah, love I that you put in what you're putting on paper is what you know you can deliver, and then you come mm-hmm. back and deliver something that's well above that. That your invest, you must have many repeat investors. Yeah. Uh, yes. I mean, and that, and that's what we're trying to get, right? We're, we're yes. trying to, you know, this is our, our goal in mind is, is to work with investors who want to work with us consistently. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's, and, and that's what we have is people who want to work with us consistently. We, we hope that we're not only is it just returns. I, I find that a lot of investors want to have, um, a, you know, a decent amount of education as well. Right. And to mm-hmm. learn about like, okay, why is this happening? Why is it happening? So it's, um, so we try to be as, as transparent as we can, uh, as well. So we try to have as many, um, you know, we try to keep the communication up to date as well. And, and just, you know, there, not everything goes great, you know, sometimes things right. go bad. And so you, we need to be able to address those things with all of our investors as well as our, our general partners. Um, yes. so, so we feel like, Hey, we're going to give you a great experience that you're going to be very happy with, with the returns. 
or where it's also going to be a great experience for you if you're interested in learning a little bit more or just want to understand a little bit more. So um, it's it's kind of like, hey, there's some tangible part of it that my bank account might might see, but there's also some intangible parts of it that, you know, uh, that I think are uh, very attractive to to investors. Yeah. And right. I would say this too, Ray, Ray, also, I don't want to just say that we only do syndications because we have done a lot of, we have done, you know, three syndications over this time of just self-storage. And, right. um, but some of our deals are also joint ventures. So you do JBs, depending on the deal well. size, we, we do JBs. Yeah. Depending as, as well. on the deal so size also, and the needs of the needs of the investors and that kind of thing. Okay. Many factors. Exactly. exactly. All right. All right. Now you, you started in multifamily 2020 came, you said, you know what, I don't want to do another multifamily deal right now. Cause I'm concerned. And, you know, you and I were both in the business. I was, you know, starting off in it then. And uh, my goodness, we didn't know what was going to happen when COVID hit, right? No idea what exactly. was going to happen. And, and we're mm -hmm. fortunate that it worked out the way it did. Um, mm -hmm. What are some advantages you see in self-storage versus multifamily? I know you looked at multiple yeah. asset classes. You had done multifamily. You said, I want to add another asset class to my portfolio. What would mm -hmm. you say are three advantages, three big advantages of self-storage over multifamily? Yeah, um, well, I would tell you this, um, and, and it, this could be broken down into many different things, but I will tell you on the maintenance side, first of all, the maintenance side, it's much easier to maintain a self-storage facility than it is a multifamily property. If you just think about it, people do, even your best renters, um, when they're inside of your apartment building, they just, there's a lot of wear and tear, right? They walk mm -hmm. on the carpet, they get it dirty, they you know, mess up the wall. They put a door through the wall. What they don't, they're not trying right. to do it. They're, they're just on accident. Their kids uh, scrape up the floors or something, you know, whatever it is, they break a window. Um, sure. So you always have, you know, just little things, even if it's a good mm -hmm. renter who's paid you on time all the time, you just have that. Yeah. Whereas in storage, you know, things don't cause wet wear and tear, right? They just sit there, right? So, and, you know, so there isn't that wear and tear on your structure. And you basically have, four or I guess three walls and, and a, and a door. It's, it's your only sort of mechanical is, is like a door, right? So you don't have much of those mechanicals that you have to constantly fix. Oh, there's a the HVAC, you know? Yeah. If mm -hmm. you do have climate control, maybe you do have some HVAC, right? Uh, roofs. Yes. You do have to fix the roofs, but you know, a, a lot of the other things it's like, we're not replacing carpet with a, uh, you know, vinyl plank or, or, mm -hmm. you know, we're not having windows broken. Right. And right. You know, those things don't really happen. You know, landscaping is not, that important because it doesn't need to look great. It just needs to be like mowed or, you know, just clean, right? It doesn't need to like, I don't need this special bushes or, you know, you know, special trees to, you know, this and that, you know, so we don't, we don't have all that, um, all those needs for, for on the maintenance side. Mm -hmm. um, and then as well as on the expense side too, there, there's a number of different ways you can cut expenses. So that's just one, but like in terms of cutting expenses, um, we run all of our properties remotely, right? Mm -hmm. So, that that really cuts down on uh, on-site payroll costs, right? So we don't really have sure. on-site payroll costs that are that are very high, like you see in multifamily. So mm -hmm. there's that expense um, that is significantly reduced. And then just talking about another expense, it's like utilities are often like a huge, uh, you know, a, a, a huge expense when it comes to uh, any any uh, properties, right? So, but in self storage, you know, we don't have anybody really on site. So there's not really a need for water, okay? Mm -hmm. so we do need electricity, sure, but yeah. we don't need it that much, right? We just, you know, it's like sometimes uh, depending on your lighting, you sometimes work with the city and they put up a, a new thousand watt LED light bulb and they just they just put it up and it, and it shines bright enough to cover your facility, you know, half of your uh. facility at night, right? So they they do that and you, you know, you pay some a little bit here and there, but if you don't have water and sewer, I mean, those are huge bills that uh, any multifamily has, you know, even if you charge rubs and, you know, it's, it's kind of this whole game all the, all the time trying to get rubs and trying to get mm -hmm. people to sign up with the rubs and you don't want to, and sometimes you don't pay what, you know, you just have the headache. Well, we just don't have water, you know, it's like mm -hmm. there's no water. So, um, so electricity is, is generally lower. Water is pretty much not there. Um, so just not having those utilities, is just, you know, it's a, a huge benefit. That's why you see in self-storage that, you know, I would say roughly, um, like roughly in multifamily, people generally use like a 50% expense ratio, right? Yeah. Whatever your income you get, you kind of say, okay, 50% of that is going to go towards my expenses, not including right. my debt. That's just mm -hmm. 50, right. In storage, 
you can comfortably just say as a rule of thumb, right? It's not every place, but it's, it's just a rule of thumb. You're going to probably use 40. So 40% of your expenses is going to, 40% of your income is going to go towards expenses. Regardless so of where you are in the country, about 40% is your expense ratio. I would say as a rule of thumb, as, as, as okay. a rule of thumb, when you're just kind of just quickly evaluating a deal, yes, you can use that. And, and, and mm-hmm. the thing is, there are many, many, many properties that operate below that mm-hmm. and, and do that fairly well. Like, some bars operate at like 33 and, and it's not wow. just us. It's like other, other facilities, even if they're manned, they can operate, you know, in the, in sort of the low to mid thirties. So to yes. say 40 is, 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 is a pretty like, I would say um, conservative rule of thumb. And mm-hmm. so, you know, how it's, and when you have that and you can actually operate maybe even say 35%, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? It's just like an extra, you just see that there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of ways to cut your expenses and, um, and your income on in your income side, there's a lot of ways to grow your income as well. Right. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. And, no, but you were going to say something else. Go ahead. Yeah. If we just wanted to talk about growing your income. So I just talked about expenses on, on the yeah, expense yeah, yeah, side. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Okay. Like, so those are expenses of, and then growing yeah. the income. How, what are some of the things that you do to grow the income? Where, where do you, how do you create the demand and, uh, I, I mean, anybody can bump rents, but what are some places where you add value where the tenants or the customers are are inclined to say, hey, yeah, I want to give Powell all my money? Yeah. So right here, where the, where the other places where you can add income, the other income streams, right? Uh, one of the one of the main ones is rent renters insurance. OK, so. um Basically, you it's an add on feature um, and a lot of places it's either. Uh, optional, um, some places required. It all depends mm-hmm. on how you want to operate it. But uh, for us, it's always required. And mm-hmm. so, you know, if you just go in the industry, some places, like half the places are going to be uh, required, half the places are not. So it's not uncommon to have insurance required. Mm-hmm. Now, if you think about it, insurance is probably, let's just say roughly it's $10 a month. Okay. Mm-hmm. $10 a month, um, depending on the, the size and how you negotiate everything, you're going to end up at about like say 50% of that income, that $10. Yeah. So $5 will actually come to you as the business owner. The other five will go to the carrier. Okay. okay. So, so you're getting $5 extra a month on each unit that's rented. Now in multifamily, you're kind of like, well, I mean, like who really cares? I mean, I got a hundred units and I'm getting five dollars. You know, I'm worried about five dollars that I'm gonna get. Mm-hmm. It's like my my rent is a, is like a thousand dollars. And you want me to increase it, you know, to get five dollars? Right. Who cares? So it's right. not a big deal in 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 um, residential. Mm-hmm. However, our facilities don't have a hundred units, right? Our facilities have like our smallest one is like 155. Our largest mm-hmm. one is eight eight hundred, right? So if you have Say you have 400 units and they're all paying five dollars. You're getting five dollars more um, a month. You know, I would say you're not going to get all of them to pay that much, but you're going to have you know somewhere about seventy to eighty percent of them uh, will probably will, will be paying that. You know, that's five dollars times four hundred, and get take eighty percent of that. Uh, sorry, I can't do the math in my head right now, but um, you you have that coming in every single month, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's kind of a sizable amount. Now you're looking at mm-hmm. a couple thousands of dollars coming in right. every month. And so that's, uh, that's just one. So that's just insurance, right? There's m- multiple ways. I-, I don't know if we need to get into every single one of them, but I can just tell you really quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes. You, we have some of our properties have cell phone towers, right? Some of our properties right. have, uh, billboards, um, mm-hmm. have billboards at ours, other ones. Um, some of them also have U-Haul rentals. So you can have a U-Haul rental there as well. Um, mm-hmm. so those are other ways that people uh, that we make money, but other people will do things like, uh, mail, uh, like PO boxes, they'll have PO boxes that people can rent out. Um, yeah. and you know, mailing services and notaries and things like that. Uh, you can do all that. We don't do all that, but these are other ways that you can make money in, right. in self-storage. Yeah. yeah. I like the cell phone towers. That is, um, I mean, it's a license to print money because the cell phone companies end up taking care of everything. Don't they? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There it yeah. is. There it is. Yeah. We are coming towards the end of our time together. This is going really quick, Powell, and I have a whole lot more questions that I want to ask you. I like uh, your uh, font of information. I'm grateful for that. Uh, Wrapping up, let me ask you a few things. Uh, 
what are you reading right now to keep yourself sharp? Or what podcasts are you listening to? What, what do you do to keep yourself up to date on what's going on in the industry so that you can continue to excel? Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, podcasts in general are what, what I do to keep up with everything. There's mm -hmm. a number of different podcasts. Like I will tell you in multifamily, there's uh, you know, there's, there's many, there's many, including yes, yours, yes. which is a great one. And, and everybody should be subscribing to yours. Um, but there are several out there. I mean, many out there the, in mm -hmm. storage, there's not quite as many. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, there's just a handful of them. So you can pick them up pretty easy and find, uh, find examples of people that are doing storage or that are talking about uh, the things that are going on in storage. There's other social media platforms too, that, you know, you can find people that are on Instagram or um, YouTube and find mm -hmm. uh information uh with people you know that are producing content out there right um inside of the just so you know really quickly in the in the self-storage industry which is a little bit different than what i've been experiencing in in, in the apartment uh, industry is that the associations are very strong in um in self-storage and that's like the state associations as well as national associations hmm. so associations of owners that's what you mean the association of owners not not uh... yeah Okay, Basically, it's it, called it. the it's it's called the self storage um, association of California, of Nevada, of Texas, of Arizona, of you know all the different states, and then there's the national ones too. Though they're very strong and they're very uh, uh, they're places a good great place to connect as well as mm -hmm. to educate you. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you're learning, you want to learn about self storage, those are great places. They have uh, conventions and books and all all kinds of different resources for people that are. Um, learning about self-storage, which is not really the case, at least my experience with, you know, with multifamily. It's the, mm -hmm. this, the, can, um, those associations, I don't know, weren't as part of a, a big part of the, in uh, my experience. Okay. Self-storage. We need to make sure we include that in our show notes, links to, to those resources, uh, along with your contact information. How, how sure. can people get in touch with you? Oh, absolutely. Appreciate that. Thank you, Ray. Um, I guess the best way to do it is to reach out to me on Instagram. So mm -hmm. it's at Powell Chi um, is my name, is, is me. There's no other Powell Chi's out there. So okay. um, I have yet to meet, a, I've yet to meet another Powell Chi. <laughs> okay. Uh, yes. it, so it. reach out to me on Instagram. Uh, that's probably the best. Uh, I, I'm also on, you know, the other platforms, uh, whether that's Twitter or Facebook. Facebook is a great one. Twitter, um, okay. LinkedIn. I just, I would say that Instagram is probably the, the, the best way to contact me. Okay, got and, it. And if people want to, I'll just give out my email as well. Um, Powell at Radiant, R-A-D-I-A-N-T-W-E, stands for Radiant World Enterprise. So RadiantWE.com. Uh, you can reach out to me there and I can put you um, put in touch. We'll have a conversation or answer your questions there. Solid. We'll make sure that people know how to reach you. Powell Chi, it has been a pleasure interviewing you today for the ROI Clear podcast. I always learn when I speak with you, and I'm glad I'm able to share this conversation with our audience. Glad to have you here, man. Appreciate it, Ray. Thank you so much again for, for having me as your guest, uh, and look forward to seeing you again soon. Yep. See you soon.